Greetings, Embers. Welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of this channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. Also, if it's your first time here and you're enjoying what you are hearing, or you've been here and haven't done so already, please remember to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Disturbing 911 and Hospital Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Quick note, the first seven stories will be the 911 stories, and the rest will be the hospital. Let's get to it, shall we? I have taken a number of frightening, stressful, disturbing calls, same as anyone else in the industry. I just watched my roommate shoot himself in the head and he's still breathing. Roommate lived long enough to be transported, died shortly after. My husband has PTSD and he has a gun. Managed to get wife and child out of the house safely, husband died. Or the non-English speaker with a choking baby. There are days getting interpreters conferenced in. Or hearing the sound of gunshots in the background. The list goes on. But the majority of the calls we process are routine. Even the emergencies. We have the cavalry at our fingertips and the capacity in most cases to get the right help to the right location in the right amount of time. This means that heart attack dad or car accident mom or fighty drinky neighbors usually aren't even blips on the emotional radar. I don't say this to minimize the level of crisis for those involved, but it helps to explain how we can be saturated without becoming, well, saturated. In reality, many of the calls that have haunted me have been the unexpected or heartbreaking details and otherwise routine calls. The world-weary eight-year-old, same age as my youngest, calling in a disturbance between mom and dad, telling me mom's a crackhead, the guy at his Christmas tree lot who had just been robbed at gunpoint, telling me the bad guy just kept apologizing the whole time he did it, the elderly woman on a routine medical call, telling me she wishes people who can still walk would get outside more, that she would give anything to just be able to go for a walk again. These are the calls I take home with me, as much as any high crisis type of call. Some days it's the best and the worst of humanity. The rest of the time, it just turtles all the way down. In the heart of my city, there sits an abandoned hospital. It stood in practice for nearly 60 years before closing its doors for the very last time in 2010. No trespassing signs and private property signs littered every external wall of the building, encouraging people to stay out. The city hoped that it would remain untouched. However, that didn't last as it eventually became a hot spot for teens and young adults to explore and party. It wasn't too long after that, rumors of the hospital being haunted circulated around the city. Once city officials caught wind of the stories and the break-ins, they decided to hire a security company with two 12-hour surveillance shifts so the hospital could be monitored 24 hours a day. Despite the enforcement, people will still break in, and depending on the situation at hand, the police will get called. For confidentiality reasons, all names have been made up. Neil. This call came in at around 3 a.m. 911, what's your emergency? 
Hi, I'm Neil from company name Security. I, I, I think I need an officer to swing by or something. A man's voice came over the line. He sounded a little panicked and out of breath. Okay, can you tell me why you need assistance? The number and address on my screen were well known to me. It wasn't out of the ordinary for security to call for backup there. Uh, I, I'm at the hospital and I'm not sure how to explain it. He sounded nervous, like this was his very first time calling. Okay, um, start from the beginning and we'll take it from there, okay? Uh, uh, um, well, I was checking the cameras I, I, like I'm supposed to do, and as I was flipping through them, I, I saw some guy standing in the nursery ward. The, the guy who trained me told me about some crazy dude who likes to hide in the nursery ward. No one really knows how he gets in. He trailed off, seeming to have lost track of what he was saying, and continued. I'm only a week and a half on the job, and it's my first day alone, and he told me that if I see the guy to scare him out of the building, but... The sound of the phone being shuffled around flooded my ears, and just as suddenly as it started, it stopped. Uh, Neil, are you still with me? I asked, breaking the sudden silence. Oh, sorry, yeah, I thought I lost one of the feeds, but it's all good, he said with a sigh of relief. Uh, that's okay, I paused, giving him a moment to breathe. So, you were saying that you tried to scare the guy out of the building, correct? Then what happened? I said, trying to press him into giving me more information. Um... I went out to find him and kick him out of the building, but when I got up there, my flashlight ran out of juice and the lights aren't allowed on because it makes people think that the hospital's still open. He trailed off again and then continued. Um, anyway, um, when I walked onto the nursery board, I could barely see anything, so I just followed the sound, and out of nowhere, someone grabbed me by the arm and pushed me to the floor. It all happened so fast, but, like, while it happened, I, I could still hear the crazy guy laughing down the hall, so I bolted out of there. There's no way it was him. Did you recheck the cameras when you got back? Uh, yeah, I looked at them again and that guy was still there, but there's no one else on that floor. I checked and then rechecked all the cameras. And I know you're probably thinking I'm crazy or something, but I have scratches on my arms from the other person on that floor. Uh, there's no way it was the other guy unless he can be in two places at once. There's no way. I could hear the panic in his voice as he spoke through what he encountered. Okay, so the scratches come from someone else grabbing your arm and not the man who was laughing, correct? I said, making sure that I was following what he was saying. Yes, I could hear his frustration with me. The crazy guy's still here. I'm watching him right now, and the other person in the building is somewhere else. Wherever they are, I can't find them with the cameras, and I'm sure as hell not going to go back up there. The police can handle it now. Okay, I've dispatched the police, and they should arrive shortly. Are you okay? Do you need paramedics for your arm? Uh, no, I don't think so. It stings like a son of a bitch, but I think I'll be fine. He cut himself off mid-sentence and gasped. <sighs> Neil, is everything all right? The, the, the man, he just, just gone. I've been watching him this whole time, and I look away for a second to look at my arm and he's gone. Wait, where is he going? Why is he, oh God, oh God. He was speaking frantically. Um, what is it? What's going on, Neil? He's, he's on the stairwells. He, he's running. What if he's coming for me? Uh, uh, what do I do? He spoke between short breaths. I, 
I, I don't have a weapon. What do I do? He raised his voice out of frustration, and I could hear him frantically opening and closing what I assumed were drawers. You're in an office, correct? Is the door locked to get inside? I heard him put down the phone and quickly shuffle to the door, and then he screamed. There was a bang on the door, another scream, and then a thud. A few seconds later, I could hear footsteps and static infiltrated the line. Neil? I spoke hesitantly into the static and waited. A few seconds later, the call was cut off. Police arrived on scene about a minute after the call ended. Neil was found in the secretary office, unconscious, with a minor injury to his head. When they had asked Neil about what happened, he apparently had no recollection. He said that the last thing he remembered was getting to work. The officer swept the entire building looking for two possible suspects, both of which could not be found. They also said they checked every possible entrance that they knew of, but there were no signs of anyone entering the building. To this day, I receive calls from security about that same man in the nursery ward. However, after Neil's incident, they no longer leave their security office and immediately call the police. Police still don't know how he gets in, but assumes that he's living somewhere within the abandoned hospital. I spent nearly a decade working with a large law enforcement agency in my home state as a police dispatcher. Instead of answering calls made to 911, my job was to remain in direct contact with and consistently provide information to officers and other first responders. During a specific graveyard shift with very few calls in its entirety, I dispatched officers to an escalating yet non-physical domestic dispute. In short, it concerned child custody, which can undoubtedly shorten tempers and set parents on edge. A father had violated the hours of his visitation rights by showing up intoxicated at two in the morning, and his ex-wife was none too pleased, prompting the emergency call when he refused to leave. Normally, the response for emergency incidents is based upon a priority system, depending on the circumstance and whether or not a person is in imminent danger. However, since it was a slow night with no incidents holding, I dispatched two available officers immediately. They arrived within minutes, separated both parties involved, and de-escalated the situation. As previously mentioned, the father was legally intoxicated, according to an administered breathalyzer, and had driven his truck to his ex-wife's house. But since he had legally parked on a public street and wasn't behind the wheel when officers arrived, he wasn't charged with drunk driving. I ran his information and background, except for a prior DUI, driving under the influence, and a couple of minor offenses his record was otherwise clean and didn't have any warrants out for his arrest. The primary officer, writing the report, that happened to respond was the patrol shift supervisor, my sergeant. A very nice man who earnestly tried to help every citizen he could, including cutting them some slack if an arrest was avoidable. He let the man off with a trespass warning and even gave him the opportunity to call someone to drive him home or use a public transport in return for his truck the next morning, after he had sobered up. Incredibly gracious considering the circumstances. This wasn't good enough. The man opted for an Uber driver, and the officers left after one had arrived. Apparently, the father had told the Uber driver to drop him off just around the next corner and proceeded to call 911 again, demanding to speak to an officer. My sergeant was made aware of this and asked me if I would call the man back to see what else he wanted. Since it wasn't extremely common for dispatchers to make callbacks, I had no problem with this request. 
The father proceeded to berate me at the top of his lungs. Vulgar language incoming. You motherfucker, you worthless piece of shit. I called you to fucking help me, but you always side with the fucking woman. Send your pansy ass officers back out here now. I've heard these expletives hundreds of times and was unfazed. I'm sorry you feel that way, sir, but I can send officers back out to you. What's your location? He proceeded to call me every name in the book, including several racial and homophobic slurs, and then ask, What's your location, you freaking homo? Never mind. I know where your building is. I'm heading over there to fuck you up. Amongst other insults, he informed me that he had utility chains and gasoline in his work truck and threatened to not only blow up our communication center, but drag my burning body around the parking lot behind his truck. Sir, I understand that you're upset, but I'd advise you not to make those kinds of threats. Everything you say is currently being recorded. He replied, you think I give a fuck? Send your pansy ass officers back out here. I'll string them up too. Go ahead, motherfucker. I happily and maliciously complied. I informed my sergeant over the phone of the father's allegations. He, as well as five other squad cars, responded. They found the man waiting by his pickup truck, back out in front of his ex-wife's house. I'll admit, this guy had a pair on him. He was promptly arrested for the following. Violation of a trespass order for reappearing at the house. Misusing an emergency line. Harassment of public safety employees for threatening me and a 911 call taker. Terroristic threatening for threatening to blow up our building. And resisting arrest once he was placed in cuffs. In summary, Tread carefully, deadbeat dad. I'm armed with a phone, a radio, a criminal database, and a patrol sergeant, and I am not afraid to use them. This last Thursday night, I took a call of a woman screaming, Oh my God, no, please don't and stop screamed over loud bass and a car engine she wasn't answering any questions stayed on the line trying to get info for over six minutes until a male voice called her a bitch for calling the cops then hung up the phone i pinged the phone but it was moving fast through multiple jurisdictions by the time i got the results on the first ping it was already out of our venue I checked previous history on the phone number, and there was none. I ran the phone through a database we used to cross-reference information on phone numbers, names, criminal records, restraining orders, etc. Nada. I also tried to get subscriber information so we could maybe contact someone who knows who owns this phone, but it's a prepaid with no information on it. I alerted the highway patrol in the neighboring jurisdiction, which is notorious for slow of any response times. Hell, it took seven and a half minutes just to get through on their emergency line. But without a vehicle description, it's pretty unlikely they're going to do anything about it. I mean, what are they supposed to do? Pull over every car, truck, or SUV with loud bass in particularly high crime areas. I continued plotting the reoccurring pings I set up, but they all stopped in one of the worst parts of that neighboring jurisdiction, within a radius of 800 meters, basically three blocks containing at least 18 buildings, some were multiple floors. Tried calling it back a few times, but each call went straight to voicemail. Then my shift ended, and I went home. I don't usually take calls home with me. Work stays at work is my motto. With maybe one or two other exceptions. I shake it all off at the door, get in my car, and go be a good dad and husband. 
but this one is sticking with me, no matter what. I could tell you what it's like to listen to a child tell you about his mom being beaten to death by his dad in front of him. I went to court to testify about that call. I could tell you about listening to a family die screaming in a fire after an accident. I can tell you that someone reporting an overdose happening in front of them had a particular note of desperation unlike any other call, or what it's like to hear someone commit suicide on the phone with you, or try to comfort an adult who just found their parent dead. I've listened to a mother scream as she realized she accidentally killed her infant. I've talked to frantic parents whose children were abducted. I've been at this job for a while. I can tell you about the time that I talked to a 15-year-old who'd been shot and left for dead in a field because he tried to sell his older brother's weed. He survived. Or the guy who had been stabbed and died on the phone with me 20 seconds before officers and paramedics pulled up. Those were all rough calls too, but at least I had some resolution to them. This one? Nope. And I probably never will. Was it a woman being sexually assaulted? Murdered? Kidnapped? Maybe all the above? I had no idea. Could have been a particularly disturbing song and a pocket dial for all I know. Was she found? Did she report what happened to her? Is she dead in an abandoned building? No clue. Is there someone frantically searching for her right now? Did I ever meet her? Maybe, but I'll never know. Not knowing is the hardest part of this job. I go from the start of one emergency to the other in second. Question, dispatch help, hang up, and repeat. In the rare case something really bothers me, I can usually ask the officer via his computer how it went. But I think I've only ever done that two, maybe three times. This call, I'll never know how it ended or what happened. I did everything I could, only for it to mean absolutely nothing anyway. Now I'm sitting at home on my days off. My baby is crying. She's teething. And my wife wants to tell me about some story or other she read on Reddit, and taxes are due, and I'm behind paying bills by a day or two. All I want is to go somewhere quiet and drink bourbon until I am not stressed anymore. But that's a bad route to go. I've seen others do it, and I'll never forgive myself for letting my family down like that. So instead, I'm a little quieter than usual, and maybe not as attentive as I'd like to be. But I'll be fine in another day or two. Just gotta suck it up and go back to work tomorrow. Fifteen years until retirement. Is that the kind of story you wanted? Can you type, talk, and hold three to four conversations at the same time? You'll learn to. The hours suck. The pay is usually around minimum cost of living for your area, but there's plenty of overtime available. You'll work with people who are in various stages of idealistic and enthusiastic slowly transitioning to burnout and bitter, and a shit ton of people with the same last names as command staff and officers who make you wonder, how do you not get fired on a nearly hourly basis? Stay long enough, you'll eventually call these people boss. Now, for the big con. You'll hear some messed up shit if you do this long enough. A mother watching her son overdose sounds different than any other woman screaming for any other reason. You'll talk to domestic abuse victims, sometimes as they're getting beaten. Sometimes you'll know them. You may hear people die in a car wreck or burn in a fire. Sometimes someone will kill themselves while on the phone with you. Sometimes you'll hear the fresh reaction of the parent of an infant that stopped breathing in the night. 
And the most frustrating part is, as soon as you disconnect from those people, you'll get a call from some Karen upset about a dog barking or a neighbor's grass being too high, or a black guy being black and bothering no one. And you'll have to treat each caller exactly as professionally as the last. Then, after that, you'll take attitude off young cops who think you're a secretary and clueless members of the public who equate you to kind of the same thing as male nurses. They have no idea how tough your job is and assume you're somehow lesser for doing it. That's the male side. If you're female, you'll be assumed to be someone chasing badges and you'll have the added difficulty of people calling in and treating you disrespectfully because they assume you're a secretary, a bimbo, and not an experienced professional or just not a cop. None of which is true, by the way. We have female officers working light duty here, as well as career dispatchers who happen to have breasts and are ten times the dispatchers their male counterparts are. Okay, a couple of pros. Because if that's the way I feel about it, why stay? Well, in spite of it all, you do get to help people when they really need it. That is a very good feeling. You sometimes are the vital link that leads to taking a bad person off the street or getting help to a vulnerable person before someone victimizes them or they hurt themselves. Occasionally, you'll meet an older officer or two who says, I can't do your job, or thanks, and it really does mean a lot. Also, there's the fact that if you can do it, it's permanent job security for as long as you want it, and it's transferable. With my experience at this point, I'm confident I can move anywhere in the country and find a job that will pay the bills, if only just, whenever I want. Typically, emergency response and public safety is resistant to change. That can be a con, but it also means pensions are commonplace and benefits tend to be pretty good. If I were you, I'd take some time and reread the types of calls I wrote about earlier. Also consider the possibility of an officer dying while you're on your radio. Every other call I mention pales in comparison. You'll never forget it, and you may always wonder if you could have done anything different that would have changed the outcome. Ask yourself if you're the type to be able to handle that and still return home to your family and be present with them. It really isn't for everyone. If you decide to, best of luck and don't be afraid to ask questions. About five years ago, I was volunteering in a listening service that was only aimed at helping children up to 18 years of age. A lot of training was required for this role, even though it was an anonymous phone service. If a child presented with a dangerous situation and we had their permission, then we would call the appropriate authorities, that is, the police or social services. After a few weeks, I was feeling settled in, and I had taken many calls. The majority were just kids joking around, but there were many tough calls, too. Most evenings, after I had finished my shift, I would feel so overcome with emotion that I would fight back tears on the way home in my car. Having a small child of my own often made it harder to forget about. One phone call in particular really startled me, and to this day, I often think of it. It was about 9.45 p.m., 15 minutes before my shift ended, and I was sitting around. I hadn't taken a call for over an hour, and time seemed to be slowly moving. My phone rings, and a petite, soft female voice says, Hello? I introduce myself giving a fake name as I always do, 
and tell her a little bit about the service and about what we do and what we do if someone is in danger. She says almost immediately, I need help. I'm babysitting my younger sister. She's about two months old and I'm nine. She's diabetic and she's turning blue. My mother and father are gone out. Please help me. I felt as though all of my training had gone out the window. I was panicking but tried my best to keep my thoughts clear and my voice clear. Go outside and get help. Go and knock at a neighbor's house and call the nearest adult you see, I insisted. The little girl talked me through her steps and said she had the baby in her arms and was out in the street, listening to the noise of the traffic and sound of the night air. My heart was beating out of my chest. It was aching to know what was going on and feeling so helpless. I could hear the little girl speaking to someone, but I couldn't make out what was being said. Next of all, a lady came on the phone. I have them... Hello? Hello? I have them both. I'm going to take them to the nearest hospital. I thanked the lady and she told me that help was on the way. I ended the call and once I gathered myself, I informed my supervisor. She was as shocked as I was when I gave her all the details. She called the hospital in the area that the girl had given me and she also called the police. After an hour of filling in the mandatory documents, my supervisor followed up the inquiry about the call we had received and they said they had no such cases. Finding it quite strange, we finished off writing the notes and shut down for the night. My next shift wasn't until the following week, which I was grateful for. I needed the time off. When I returned after my week off, my supervisor called me into her office and informed me that she had gone through my notes on the call I received and had gone through searching the system for similar scenarios and keywords. She told me that every caller has a profile and that the girl who had called was a frequent caller and that she wasn't a little girl but a lady in her early 30s in a psychiatric hospital and she liked to pose as different people, but mostly as a child. This creeped me out considering the nature of the service and the fact an adult was abusing the service. This information angered me and also disturbed me. I felt silly and naive as I had believed this girl's story. Over the next few months, she called a few more times under different descriptions and always posing as a vulnerable person. I wasn't there for much longer, but that story always gives me the creeps whenever I think about it. So I'm a relatively new dispatcher. I've been working for about a year and a half in a small town. I work four tens and three of those. I am alone for the entire shift, working police and fire. In the last year and a half, I have never lost someone. For some reason, my suicidal subject and welfare check calls have all been false alarms, and my medical calls, EMR, was always able to get them stable enough to wait for an ambulance. Those calls were few and far between to start, but all turned out okay, and I was still very green in that respect. About two weeks ago, I had someone from out of state call in in near hysterics because a woman, we'll call her M, in our town was sending cryptic suicidal statements to her via text, but no one knew exactly where she was. M had made statements about not being far from home and something about a cemetery and that she was going to hang herself. The family member said M had made an attempt about a month prior, but law enforcement intervention saved her life. I called the last person M had seen and then called every person M was known to associate with for vehicle description, clothing description, mood, 
anything that could help me. I also started a ping on her cell phone, had officers checking all local cemeteries, and requested help from the sheriff's office when the ping was located outside our jurisdiction. Eventually, the sheriff's deputies found M unresponsive in a cemetery a two miles south of the ping, but it was too late. It was the first person I had ever lost, and I beat myself black and blue, replaying all the calls in my head. Everything everyone said and everything I did. Did I do everything right? Was I fast enough? What if I were faster? Did I miss something that could have helped find her in time? We had a picture of her in our system, and I dreamed about her face for at least a week. Tonight, I get a call from a suicide hotline advising of a male with a knife walking through town with the intent to end it all. That night with M came rushing back, and I started to get almost nervous. But also, I was determined that this one would be different. I pinged the phone and got officers moving. I looked up his file to see what past incidents had occurred for maybe a clue of a resident. I even got a tracking dog out to try and locate. As I'm on the phone requesting my third ping update, an officer calls out with him, and he is okay. He is emotionally upset but physically okay, and I felt the air go out of me. Once they cleared, I had an officer come in and watch the calm so I could step outside and I felt like a weight had been lifted off of me. I saved this one. I felt like crying and I don't know if that is normal. Maybe I'll actually sleep tonight without seeing Mrs. Face. I know this sounds like a pointless story and maybe even dumb to an extent, but... My family at home doesn't really understand my career or what goes on, and I just needed to get it out. All right, dear listeners, we will now be switching over to the hospital stories. Let's get started. Hi, I'm a French girl and I'm 18, so excuse me if my English is not perfect as it is not my native language. So, let's talk about the most traumatic thing in my life. Situation. At that time, I was 12 years old, so I am still in middle school and live in a house with two floors. I lived in a small village where everyone knew each other, and you knew very quickly if there was a new neighbor or if there was an intruder who was looking for something. I had a large garden, and many overlooked the neighbor's garden on both sides of the house. Remember, this is important for the next. So, one day, my friend and I finished classes earlier, so we came back from middle school. I accompany her and I go home on the way. I feel that I am being followed. The guy is on the other sidewalk, and he is walking a good distance from me. I start walking faster. I arrive at the first door when I unlock very quickly, and I start to run towards my front door, hardly further. I come in. I close it with double turns and I go upstairs in the living and dining room. I don't panic too much until I see a man stepping over my gate and come into the courtyard of my house. At that time, it was in summer, so windows were open, of course. So I hasten to close all the windows possible and ditto for the floor where there are the bedrooms. I hear the guy whistling and I panic a little. I call my mother, but no answer. My father is abroad, so I'm alone, in a big house, with a guy who has followed me and who is potentially trying to break into my house. Almost a few minutes later, I hear the door slam, the handle moved in all directions. The guy wanted to break into my house, me, a 12-year-old girl. I'm panicking, and I just feel trapped. I didn't know if my neighbors were there, so I couldn't do anything. Later, the noise stops and I see the guy coming out of my yard. Except that what I had forgotten is that there is a path which is hardly further from the house which leads to the forest and therefore the gardens of the three houses of which mine is one. 
I calm down. I go to my kitchen with a window and a French window that overlooks the garden. I cook myself. I turn around and the guy is at the edge of my garden looking at me with a smile. He spans the fence. It's not very high and is about to run towards the windows to come to my house. And luckily, my neighbor loved gardening, and he saw it and yelled at him to get out, otherwise he would call the cops. The guy left. I went to my mother's house, crying, and I never came home alone until we moved out. This is one of the scariest stories of my life. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. I apologize that that story was a little confusing, but... I still wanted to include it. Anyway, on we go. I'd like to preface this by saying that not all mental health professionals are terrible people. Good doctors and medication have saved many of lives. I also didn't grow up in the US, so if you see something in this story that makes you go, that's not how that works, Keep in mind that other countries might have different laws. Furthermore, this describes my experiences with staying at a mental hospital, so prepare for triggers. All right, here we go. I was a troubled kid. I'm kind of a troubled person in general, but when I was in my early teens, specifically in this story, I was 14, I was cutting, suicidal, and refusing to go to school. So, I was put on a waiting list for a children's mental hospital. I know now the fact that I was on the waiting list for close to half a year should have been the first warning sign. At the time, I enjoyed being on sick leave from school, which basically meant I got to play The Sims until 6 in the morning for 5 months straight. But, when I had to pack my stuff to actually go to the hospital, I, of course, didn't really want to go. I wanted to get help, don't get me wrong, but the idea of being away from home for six weeks, which is the standard time that takes to analyze and watch you to give you a diagnosis, after which you can choose to pursue treatment, scared me to death. I arrived at the hospital in tears, my mom carrying my suitcase for me. The nurses noticed that obviously I didn't want to stay. Are you here on your own free will? The doctor asked me. I shook my head. They just shrugged it off, saying they could get a judicial decision forcing me to stay there. I never go talk to a judge. I never got to defend or explain myself. And as far as I know, my parents didn't talk to a judge either. A judge glossed over my medical history and then signed a piece of paper that forced me to stay in this hellhole for six weeks. The contents of my suitcase were searched, and I remember feeling like I had just arrived in prison. The first terrifying thing happened on my first night. As a cutter, my arms were in horrific shape. When wounds heal, they itch. I scratched open some of the old scabs, and then I went to the nurse to ask for a bandage. Everyone went nuts. In their eyes, I had purposefully harmed myself, which they couldn't prove, but okay. So, what do you do when a 14-year-old mental patient harms herself? Talk to her? Try to help? Nah. You take away all her jewelry, a necklace for my mom and a bracelet for my ex-girlfriend who, at the time, I had still very strong feelings for, and send her off to the timeout room for 20 for hours. The timeout room was a small room with a big window that could just barely fit a bed. If I had to use the bathroom, I had to ask a nurse to accompany me. And, no joke, at one point I was in the bathroom with a nurse standing guard in front of the door. She asked if I was doing okay, and I sarcastically responded with, No, I'm cutting myself with the toilet paper. She goes, really? And rips open the door. Fucking Christ. All of my clothes, including underwear and PJs, were taken from my room and kept in the front office for the time. I stayed in the timeout room. So whenever I needed clothes, I had to go up to the front desk 
to ask for them. But apart from having to ask for clothes and bathroom trips, I was completely left alone in that room. No one ever came to check on me. Getting out of the timeout room wasn't a lot better. For the first week or two, I had horrible stomach problems. I would get up multiple times a night to use the bathroom, which, by the way, you didn't have one in your room. You had to walk down the hall to the bathrooms. Because my stomach kept me up all night, I would often not get enough sleep and end up sleeping throughout the day, which led to me not taking part in group activities. And instead of, I don't know, waking me up, I was bitched at that, and I quote, If I was up all night roaming the halls, I'd be tired too. What? What do you want me to do? Just sit and shit in my bed or what? I thought. And because I didn't partake in group activities, I couldn't earn outside time. Yes, I had to earn going outside. Even just sitting on the front steps with a nurse right next to me had to be earned. So, for the first six weeks, I was effectively locked up, except for school and weekends, where I was allowed to go home. It was blatantly obvious that none of the nurses really cared about any of the patients. They weren't even real nurses. They were more like prison guards. One of them straight up looked like a homeless guy. Another sounded like she'd been a five-packs-a-day smoker her whole life and all and I mean all of them were chain smokers. Every free second they had, they used for smoke breaks, right outside the door too, with the doors open, so that all the other kids who were currently going through nicotine withdrawals could smell the cigarette smoke. I saw a real nurse once a week. She mainly checked for self-harm. One time, I self-harmed at home over the weekend I told her my pet bunny did it, and she believed me. Within six weeks of staying at the mental hospital, I saw a psychiatrist a whopping two times. Once for a general introduction and one for an IQ test. Oh, and did I mention that you were allowed to have a razor in the shower? Or the huge bird spider that sat in the corner of one of the showers for the entire time I stayed there? or the cobwebs and silverfish that were everywhere. Anyone who's ever struggled with mental illness knows that sentences like, just pull yourself together, or get over it, are the least helpful things one could say to a mentally ill person. I've never heard it that much in my life. There was one instance where another patient, who was deadly afraid of spiders, came running out of her room in a borderline panic attack because she had woken up to a spider directly in front of her face. Know what they told her? Don't be such a baby, it's just a spider. They gave her a broom for her to get rid of the spider herself, which obviously she couldn't do. My roommate and I ended up helping her. Both of us were scared of spiders as well, mind you. But possibly the most outrageous thing happened on my second to last day. Someone had told the guards that I had smuggled in a razor blade. So they pulled me out of breakfast and searched my body from top to bottom, stripping me naked. With the door to the nurse's room wide open, when they didn't find the razor blade on me, they tore apart my room. They didn't find one there either, but found one laying on the floor in the hallway. It was even still in its little wrapper. I wasn't the only patient who cut herself. As a matter of fact, I didn't think there was a single female patient who didn't cut herself. That blade could have belonged to anyone. They had no proof it was mine. But, of course, it was deemed that it was and despite me not having any new cuts on my arm, I was thrown into the timeout room for another 24 hours. Literally, my last 24 hours. And they paid so little attention to the timeout room that a fellow inmate was able to slip a letter with a razor blade inside under the door so I could take out my frustrations on myself. 
in case any of you were wondering where my parents were in all of this. My mother wanted to get me out of that place as soon as she heard about the timeout room. But since my parents had joint custody, she needed my father to agree to it. My father deserves a let's not meet story for himself. But to make it short, he hadn't talked to me in over four years, but was somehow convinced that I needed help and refused to get me out of there. My final diagnosis from that place? Narcissistic neurosis. I was 14. And to this day, I have no idea how they came up with any kind of diagnosis, considering I had seen an actual doctor a total of two times. Additionally, this result was delivered to us, my parents and I, I mean, by the head doctor of the hospital, who I had never seen in my life, during a conclusive meeting on my last day. I was offered to stay and start behavioral therapy, but I guess it goes without saying that I politely declined that offer. Every therapist and psychiatrist I have talked to since, and trust me, there's been a few over the last seven years, have disregarded that diagnosis entirely. Some even laughed at it. I'm currently diagnosed with bipolar disorder and depression and a panic disorder and my current psychiatrist has suggested I might suffer from borderline personality disorder. I guess the moral of this story is to always do research on the hospital you plan on getting yourself admitted to. I sure as shit hope I never have to see any of those guards, nurses, or doctors ever again. Dear listeners, just so you all know, I've been through this exact situation when I was younger. I'm deciding to keep that story out of this narration, unless you all would like to hear it at some point. On we go. When I was in high school, I got the flu very badly. I had such a high fever, the doctors were worried about seizures and or brain damage. In the hospital, and after they were able to get me to a semi-human temperature, they wanted to x-ray my lungs for damage. I went to walk to radiology, but my doctor saw me and panicked and said I should not be standing, let alone walking. So they plopped me in a wheelchair and rolled me down. My nurse situates me under the machine and tells me to wait there for her, and then we'd get started. She left the room, and I was just kind of looking around, waiting. I saw another nurse, very pretty, with dark hair, in the room. She told me to go with her. I shook my head and said no, that the other nurse said I needed to stay here. Pretty nurse asked if I was sure, and I said yes. My nurse came back in and began to get me ready for my chest x-ray. It was then I noticed that the door she entered from was the only one. Pretty nurse was gone. My first job was at a SNF. I usually worked day shift, but I had picked up a night shift because they were so short staffed. We only had a handful of people working at night, so it was pretty quiet. I'm sitting at the far end of the nurse's station, which is at the end of the back hallway. I hear a call light go off, and I remember thinking it was strange because the resident who lived in that room had end-stage dementia and didn't move that much. I go to the room and the blinds are moving and the patient looked like she was sleeping. I called her name and she didn't respond, which was her baseline. But then I put my hand on her shoulder and she was dead cold. I turned the call light off and turned the light on. She had passed and from the coolness of her skin and stiffness, I think it had been a while. I then went to find a CNA to help with her. I also figured the blinds were moving because of our old heater that sat under the blinds. I go back to my desk to check the chart for funeral information and such, and the call light goes off again. At this point, I thought maybe a CNA was calling me to the room, so I walked up and down the hallway, looking for them. 
I then canceled the call light from the nurse's station. There was no one around except for sleeping residents. I went to the front nurse's station where one of the CNAs was sitting reading a book. I told her what happened and she said she had been there the whole time. We headed back down the back hallway to find the call light going off again and the door shut. Maybe I had shut the door and maybe the heater was moving the curtains, but I'll never quite understand the call light. I truly believe she was letting us know that her soul was free from her body and that she wanted to say goodbye to us. She was a long-term resident who never had visitors and I truly think we were all she had at the end. Nothing ever spooky happened in that room again, or at least for the following year that I was there. I'm usually a pretty jumpy person when it comes to supernatural stories, but for the same strange reason, I wasn't scared at all. It was like a peaceful goodbye. I don't know how else to explain it. I was walking down the hallway and going into the clean utility room to get a warm blanket. Somebody was walking about six to eight feet ahead of me. I couldn't tell you anything about them or what they looked like, but I remember thinking it was a staff member. They opened the door to the clean utility, which requires a punch code, and it shut just before I got to it. Mildly annoyed that they didn't hold it for me, I opened the door. Nobody is in there. I thought it was weird, but I didn't tell anybody about it or think much of it. Later that night, a co-worker and I were talking about the shift and she said, Oh yeah, and now we have a ghost. I asked her what she meant and she went on to explain my exact experience. Only it had been told to her by another co-worker. Same hallway, same clean utility same general feeling of it, being a staff member, but he couldn't tell you any descriptive details, all of it. It has since happened to three more people over the last year or so. I work on an adult oncology unit where unfortunately we have a lot of comfort care patients. The majority of them transition to hospice where they live out their final days. Sometimes they don't quite make it and pass away while they are still in the hospital. We have the most deaths in the hospital on our unit, and a lot of floats don't like coming up to our floor because everyone dies. We all love it though and wouldn't have it any other way. There is so much love between the nurses and our patients. We get to know them really well. When people pass away, we have noticed that, not surprisingly, it comes in threes. We will go a few weeks with one passing away. Everyone successfully makes it out of there and home on hospice or to a TCU or whatever they go to to pass on. Only to have a week or two where we have three to six deaths a week. One week, we had two patients pass away in one night. One of the patients was in a room eight. She was really near and dear to our hearts, and it was a rough time for everyone involved. She had been on the floor for a prolonged period of time, and we all watched her go from a spry old lady to basically wasting away in all aspects. She passed on nights, and by that next day, there was a new patient in her room. It's hard on us, but as we all know, patients come and go and we have to move on. I was doing the admission with the new patient and going over room orientation stuff. I explained that she had a one-stop shop remote which controlled the lights, TV, radio, and had the call light. Right as I finished explaining to her that the TV buttons are right here, I set the remote down on her bed and instantly the TV turned on by itself. It began flipping through each channel at an alarming rate, 
faster than if you were to just hold down the channel up button. She was a little older and thankfully was not observant and thought I was doing it, but no one was touching it. She says, no thank you, I don't want to watch TV right now. So I reached down and tried to turn it off. Didn't turn off. I ended up panicking a bit inside and yanking the remote out of the wall and telling her that it seemed to not be working properly and that I would need to get her a new one. The TV still wouldn't turn off even after I unplugged the remote from the wall and normally it would all be connected and not work if it wasn't plugged in properly. I ended up having to walk and manually shut the TV off. I headed out of there telling her I'd be right back and as I went to the nurse's desk to grab another one, I ran into another nurse. She was grabbing another remote, which was odd. We just got a new shipment in and they were all normally working properly. We barely had to replace them anymore. I asked her if her remote was broken too and she said that hers was acting up. I asked her which room she was in and it was another room that a patient had passed in the night before also. The TV remotes were uncharacteristically acting up from across the wing at the same time in the same rooms that people had died the night before. Pretty freaky stuff. I could ramble forever, but most stories are related to the TV. I had another situation similar to the one I just described, when the volume was just going up and down by itself, in a room where a patient had passed away recently. I've seen lights not work and then work again, and have even seen a sink turn on when there was no one else around. We have several designated rooms that are reserved for our comfort care patients, and even when they are unoccupied, we will walk by them and it feels like someone's in there, but when we look, it's clearly empty. We've got a room where IV pumps stop working and BP machines quit on us, and nothing seems to work, but that room got cleansed by a healing touch volunteer. Which I know sounds crazy, but now everything in the room works just fine. That's a story for another day. I've never really been a huge believer in the supernatural, but after working on this unit this past year, it's hard not to believe in the paranormal. We all just embrace it, because what can you do really? Four years ago, I needed serious surgery to remove a tumor in my brain. The doctor said everything was going to be nice and easy, but it took me two years to return and finish school. The surgery went so poorly that when anesthesiologists and nurse were trying to keep me alive, the surgeon had a conference with the parents to keep them up to speed. Brain bleeding, severe swelling in the brain stem, etc. What's weird is that during this conference, my mom's cell phone rang. The caller ID showed it was coming from my cell phone. I had put my dad in charge of my phone in case the worst were to happen. Notify girlfriend, friends that I had passed. Anyway, he pulls my phone out of his pocket and it's turned off, battery removed. They wrap up the meeting with the surgeon and as they walk to the nurse's station, to thank them for looking after me. My mom's phone buzzes twice. She had a voicemail left by whoever was calling her for my phone. She listened to it and she heard me, my voice. Hey mom, it's me. I know things are weird right now, but I'm sitting here on this bench and I'm warm. I think everything will be okay. Talk to you later. Say hi to dad. About a month after my surgery, when I had recovered and moved back home, my mom had me listen to the voicemail and I couldn't believe it. I turned white. I cried. When I heard my own voice, I thought maybe I had died and was being punished. I immediately opened my phone and looked through the call history. There, 
I saw the timestamp of an outgoing call on the date of my surgery. 20 minutes after, I was wheeled into the operating room. I don't know what in the world caused this. My dad passed away in 2016. I was able to spend a lot of time with him before we went, and my brother and I set him up in an amazing care facility in Australia, where he was for a couple of months before he passed. The place had a small cafe with a barista, and I would frequently go and grab us a coffee. Dad couldn't walk anymore, and I was having a harder time getting him into a wheelchair to get him out of the room and outside. He also wasn't eating as much or interested in much of anything. This is all pretty normal for someone who's dying. I knew he was, and I knew he'd go pretty soon, but nobody else seemed to think so for some reason. Anyhow, I asked Dad if he'd like a latte, and for the first time in a few days, he said yes. I was excited he was interested, so I headed over to the cafe got us both a coffee, and headed right back. I walked into the room and said, I've got your coffee, Dad. I noticed Dad was staring at the far corner of the room. He looked from the corner of the room to me when I walked in. Then, after I spoke, he looked back to the corner and back to me and said, What about Mom? My mom died in 2008. Now, since I've seen ghosts in a bunch of weird experiences... I'm all abroad on this train, and without missing a beat, I look at the corner and at him and I say, I can get a coffee for mom, no worries, and dad looked from me to the corner back at me, the reality clearly dawning on him, then quickly shook his head. While my dad did have some confusion when he first came to this place, he settled down pretty quick. He didn't see anything else that he mentioned and was lucid right up to the end. I'd like to think that mom came to see him as he passed on. So, I work as an elderly care worker down the southwest of Australia. I love my job and love all of my residents who I took care after and gained real cool friends with plenty of them there. Sometime in early 2018, one of my favorite residents was put on palliative care, end of life care, basically, which we look after more intensely, making sure they feel at most comfortable before they pass away. Anyway, I was about to spend a good amount of time of my shift being able to care for her in her final moments, and as my shift ended, I got to say a last goodbye before I clocked off and went home to sleep. That night, I had a dream where I was with my friends at the beach, and we were running down the stairs to head to the water. When I turned my head to the left and find the resident who I looked after sitting there, staring at the ocean with just a blank look on her face, I walk up in front of her and greet her, asking if she was feeling okay. I remembered in my dream that she was meant to be in strict palliative care, to which she replied with, No, no, I don't think I am. I kind of nodded to her and hoped that she feels better real soon, for I kind of wanted to wake up at that point. But the freaky part was I woke up in another dream where I'm lying on my stomach in my room, in my bed, where I was experiencing a sleep paralysis and I hear behind me. You guessed it. The little old lady's voice telling me, the name of a resident is dead, right? You know she was hurt, right? Shortly after hearing that, I feel two hands push on my body as if they were trying to push me out of the bed, at which point when I woke up in the early morning of around 4 a.m., heavily breathing and just straight up quite shaken. After going back to sleep and waking up in the morning and heading to work, I found out that the little old lady had passed away at the same time that I woke up from my sleep paralysis 
I have told this story to a few friends to freak them out, but I have never actually looked up details on this sort of thing happening. Call it paranormal or coincidence. I'm just quite unsure. I work in a rural mental health center in my hometown. This happened about a year after I first started working there. I was also going to college full time and only going to work part time. I worked at the front desk at the time and there was one particular client who took a liking to me. This guy had done a lot of meth in his day and it basically fried his brain. He had drug induced schizophrenia and is also really into conspiracy theories. At some point, we spoke while he was checking in, and he found out my mom's last name through that conversation. We have a different last name due to my parents' divorce, but for the life of me, I cannot remember ever giving that kind of personal information to a client. But it could have been that he just knew who my family was, since this is a small town, and basically everyone knows everyone. Plus, my family owns a pretty big business in our town. But he remembers me telling him, so really, who knows? About a month or two after that, he started calling two or three times a day for me. Keep in mind, I'm not a clinician. I don't have any one client I talk to, so it's weird for a client to ask for me. But he would only call when I was in class or on PTO days. One day, his clinician pulled me aside and told me that he was concerned for my safety because of the client. The client had come in for an appointment and told his therapist that he had a premonition about me. Something bad had happened to me and he was going to be the one who saved me. Apparently one night, while he was watching his regular unsolved crime shows, he ran across a story about Leah Rachel Peebles who just so happens to have gone missing in the same state I live in and shares my last name, and her middle name is similar to my first name. On top of that, my co-worker's name was AJ, and Leah had a pimp named AJ. He had got it in his head that I was Leah, and I had been kidnapped by my family and my co-worker and brainwashed into thinking I was who I am now and as a result, lost all my memory of my previous life. He was determined to save me and return me to my correct family. After that, I started noticing his car around pretty much wherever I went. He stalked my Facebook and messaged all of my family members I had listed and my top friends. Luckily, I had told all these people about this guy and to not engage him. When he didn't get a reply, he wouldn't push it, except with my mom, who also works in the facility I work in, just in IT. He would message her daily asking about me, asking why she took me and if she felt bad. I had to be walked in and out of work for about six months after, and I couldn't go anywhere in public alone. I don't go out that much, so that wasn't much of an issue. I think he dropped it eventually. I'm still not allowed to be out front when he's coming in, and occasionally I still see his car drive by my house every once in a while, which is even creepier because I've moved twice since then. So, creepy client, I hope I never meet you again. I was a nurse for seven years. In my entire career, I worked at a single facility. The facility had many renovations done during the years since it opened in 1960. By 2011, when I started there, only half the facility was the original building and the rest had all been added on over the years. I worked nights, mostly because I'm a night owl and found it easier than mornings. I had a number of odd experiences, but I'll share the main ones that stick with me. Firstly, 
I have had experiences with the supernatural since the age of three, so I believe in the supernatural, but I'm not obsessed. More aware of it, if that makes sense. There was one wing in particular that was part of the original building, which had a small sitting room with a television for residents to enjoy during the day. During my night shifts, this one area gave me such a feeling of dread and fear that I would only be near it for as long as I had to. I would go out of my way and take the long way back to the nurse's station just to avoid being near it. Nothing I know of happened there, but my gut feeling was screaming at me that there was something there and it was not happy. This feeling eased during daylight, but once it was night, the feeling was there. It felt as if someone was watching me and they didn't like the fact I was there. I spoke to a few other nurses about this and they all claimed they experienced the same feelings. One other incident sticks with me. A 90-year-old woman, let's call her Jane, went to a breakfast then asked to be taken back to her room for a sleep. She was a very healthy woman, but said she said she wasn't feeling well. When the nurse did her next round 20 minutes later, she found that the resident had passed away in her sleep. I found out it was an aortic aneurysm, so she didn't suffer. Unfortunately, death is rarely quick in aged care. It's usually a slow process of days or weeks. Jane was a very sweet Polish lady. She had outlived her children, and her husband had passed away many years ago, so she never had visitors. I would check on her and bring her tea at exactly 9.30 p.m. and say goodnight. As you would probably guess, not everything goes to schedule in healthcare, and it's not always possible to stick to a strict routine, but if it got to 9.35, she would ring her call bell asking for her tea, then apologize profusely for ringing her bell, and every time I answered with, whenever you need help, press the button, you're not in trouble, I love to help. She would then tell me her usual, good night, sweet girl, and I'd leave and get on with my shift. The funeral home was late to pick her up. I helped the undertaker in the afternoon when I started my shift. All the rooms had a call bell next to the toilets, one next to the bed, and the residents wore a necklace or bracelet with a call bell attached to it. When a resident passes, their room's call bells are disconnected the same day, and the personal bell is put in a nurse's station ready for the next person to move in. At 9.36, the call bell to her room started ringing. This was not possible. Her room had been disconnected, and her personal bell was sitting in a drawer next to me. Slightly freaked out, I went down to her room and checked to make sure there wasn't a dementia patient who had wandered in there. Maybe maintenance hadn't turned the bell off, even though I personally spoke to them after they did so. I was just trying to rationalize it, I guess. I went into the room and it was pitch black. No one was inside, and the bells had definitely been turned off, as I was unable to turn it off from inside the room and I had to cancel it from the main desk. I instantly had a feeling of peace. Weird, because in every other situation, I would have been a mess. I think she was just saying goodbye. As I was closing the door to her room, I heard a shriek and my best friend came running down the corridor crying and in a state. Once I got her to calm down, she said, I was in X-Wing charting and Jane walked past in her 90. Then she turned the corner to the front wing, but when I looked around the corner, she wasn't there. She's dead. What the fuck did I just see? Whatever had happened, I hope Jane is at peace. Here's hoping I will be able to relate this story as best as I can. English is not my first language. 
I am a nurse who used to work the graveyard shift in a psych unit in a large hospital outside Chicago. Normally, there would be two nurses in our shift, but on this particular night, we had Joyce, who was still on orientation phase. When it was Joyce's turn, at around 2 a.m., to have a one-hour break, the charged nurse, Pam, told her she may use the MSW's office at the end of the hallway, so the night supervisor couldn't see her sleeping. This office has a couch which anyone can comfortably sleep. About 30 minutes passed, I saw Joyce in the hallway looking terrified. Pam quickly glanced up at her from the computer. You're up too early. Go back. Joyce, hell, almost out of breath. <sighs> I just had a dream. It was almost real. I, I dreamed I was in the uh, that same dark office lying on the couch, and there was a black cat looking at me for a long time. Then slowly, I felt like two hands choking me in the dark. I couldn't breathe. Then the cat jumped across my body. Then at that moment, I woke up. It, it, it felt so real. Pam now has her full attention on Joyce. Oh, look at your neck. You have red scratches on your neck. There really were red scratches on Joyce's neck, like somebody or something held her neck for a long time. We didn't use that office for breaks anymore. I was in there myself before this happened, and I couldn't stand the darkness of the room. It felt like somebody was watching me. I wasn't able to sleep at all. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true disturbing 911 and hospital stories. I'd like to give a very special thank you to the reform members of the channel. Colt Stonewolf, Interscare Wifey, Howler's Mom, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Batty's Knees. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.